We'll go ahead and get started. I want to give us as much time uh, as possible today. Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Steltenpole. I'm the Training and Education Manager at the Center for Open Science. I'm really excited to introduce uh, Crystal Lewis. So we've got two crystals on the call today. Um, Crystal Lewis, uh, she's managed uh, education research data for over 10 years and is a very good friend of COS. Um, and we're here to talk today about, um, she's going to give an overview of her open access book, which is called Data Management and Large-Scale Education Research. And it provides uh, a holistic overview of how to manage uh, uh, research data throughout the entire research life cycle. Um, and she's also going to share some key takeaways and um, we'll also have an opportunity um, at the end for a couple of questions. So um, during the course of uh, this webinar, uh, feel free to um, chat amongst yourselves uh, within the chat, um, ask any questions. Um, if it's if you can, um, please use the Q&A function. If you have any questions for Crystal specifically, I will be monitoring the chat during uh, the webinar. Um, but it, it'll be easier to collate them uh, to ask her during the Q&A session um, if they're in that Q&A function. So if you're uh, hovering over Zoom, um, it should be at the bottom of the screen, or at least it's the bottom of my screen. Um, and there's a little question mark with a box uh, that says Q&A. So feel free to use that. Um, with that, I'm going to give the floor to Crystal and uh, let you take it away. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Crystal. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today to learn about this open access book, Data Management and Large-Scale Education Research. Um, my name is Crystal Lewis. I am currently a freelance research data management consultant, which means I help researchers organize, document, curate, and share their research study data. And I typically work with education researchers in particular who are collecting data for these kinds of large-scale, federally funded randomized control trial research projects. Um, but before I started working for myself, I was a data manager for the Missouri Prevention Science Institute at the University of Missouri for eight years. And that experience is where my sort of love for all things data management grew out of. Um, so today I'm going to spend about 40 minutes giving a brief presentation. I'll share the backstory on why I wrote this book, and then I'll give a brief overview of what this book is about, as well as share a few key takeaways from the book. And then the last minutes, I'll just open up the floor for questions and discussion, like Crystal said. Um, so feel free to pop those questions into the chat or the Q&A while I talk, and then um, other Crystal can help me work through those questions um, after the presentation. But before we begin, I did want to kick this talk off with a really quick, very informal poll. I want to learn more about you all and your experience. So if you don't mind, please answer this one really quick question for me. Teresa, would you mind sharing it? The question is, how confident are you in your research data management practices. So your options are very confident, confident, slightly confident, not at all confident. And the last one is, what is research data management? So we'll give you about 20 to 30 seconds. Okay, it looks like we've got most people in here. Give it another second, just in case. Great. <clears throat> so first, thank you for sharing. Um, and I would say the results are pretty much what I would expect. I think we have a slightly more knowledgeable group today um, than I typically have in other presentations, but we still have several people who are feeling uh, not at all confident or slightly confident, and I would expect that. Um, so, so again, thank you for sharing. All right, let me get rid of this real quick. Oh, sorry, can you see the results? Crystal, can you see the results? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool, I'm gonna exit out of here. Okay, so when I started my career in academic research about 11 years ago or so, I would have been someone who answered the what is research data management option. Um, before I took my job at the University of Missouri, I had never even heard the term research data management before. I had learned about data cleaning in grad school, and I genuinely knew what you know a database was and what a codebook was, but that was about it. 
So for me, when I started my role 11 years ago, if I had to guess what research data management was, I would have told you that it just meant cleaning your data when it's messy. And I would have never guessed that it entailed so much more. Oops, sorry. So what else does it entail? Um, so research data management is the process of creating organized, documented, accessible, reusable, secure, and quality research data. And as you can see, this includes much more than just data cleaning. It involves processes that actually happen long before you ever get to the data cleaning phase, long before you even collect your data. <clears throat> And it turns out that the sentiment of not knowing what data management is or not feeling confident in how to manage data is fairly common. A lot of people feel uncertain about their data management practices. So in this study that we see here from Bruce Roseveren and Jessica Logan, who are hopefully on this call, uh, they surveyed 202 education researchers and across six different data management practices, the percentage of participants who felt very confident in their data management practices ranged from about 10% to 50%, depending on the practice. And as I was doing my formal interviews for this book, and as I had informal discussions with researchers in the field as well, this was the story I was hearing time and time again. There were not many people who felt very confident in their data management practices. For the most part, people just sort of feel like they're winging it. And there's good reason for this. Most of us aren't learning data management at all, or we're learning through informal methods. So there are several studies about this lack of formal training. So in this first study we see here, when authors asked 150 graduate students if they needed more training in research data management on a scale from one to 100, the average score was 80. And we see a similar story in the second study where 274 psychology researchers were asked where they learned data management practices and only 33% said they learned from college coursework. And then in the Severn and Logan study again, they also found that across nine different data management practices, over 60% of respondents reported having no formal training in each practice, except software training was, I think, a little bit lower. So if researchers aren't learning data management through formal training, how are they learning? How did I learn? Well, many people are learning from colleagues or mentors. And while this is a good start, it's definitely better than nothing. It also has its downsides, right? For one, no one is learning practices in a standardized way. Some people may be learning to do something one way from one colleague. Others are learning to do that same practice in an entirely different way from another colleague. And sometimes that might be okay. But when it comes to things like organizing data sets for public sharing or creating metadata for reuse of data, we need researchers to learn more standardized practices. Uh, many people are learning from experience as well. So the longer you do this, the more you learn, right? But this is an unnecessarily painful way to learn data management because it usually involves lots of mistakes, lots of time lost, and sometimes even data lost. And so while this does work eventually, it's not the preferred method. Another means of learning data management is institutional supports, such as university libraries. Research, uh, research librarians typically provide data management consultation to teams, which is excellent, but unfortunately, most of the support is either discipline agnostic or STEM focused. Um, also, this support isn't available for everyone, right? So people working outside of uh, university settings don't necessarily have this resource. And also from my totally anecdotal experience, there are still several research teams who are not taking advantage of this kind of support. Uh, but hopefully this presentation will bring more awareness to the availability of this resource. And then last, people also learn data management through self-education. So this includes things like reading books, blog posts, attending webinars, attending workshops. But unfortunately, again, most of the existing material is either discipline agnostic or STEM focused. There are very few resources available to help researchers navigate data management in the context of an education research study. And having discipline focused resources is important because education research has its own unique needs when it comes to data management. Researchers are often collecting human subjects data in real world environments such as school systems. And keeping that data secure and reliable in a deliberate and orderly way can be overwhelming. And it becomes even more challenging the larger the study gets. So when more participants are included and you're collecting data in many different ways over several waves of time, it becomes even more difficult to keep track of everything. Okay, but let's step back for a minute and ask ourselves, why does this matter? Why should we care about the fact that a lot of people are reporting feeling not very confident in their data management practices? So one, data management is typically required to maintain compliance. 
So in the U.S., federal funders that education researchers often work with, including IES, NIJ, NIH, NSF, all require a data management plan as part of their funding application. And this plan should contain information about how you intend to collect, store, manage, and publicly share your research data products. So to the right here is an example data management and sharing plan template from the National Institutes of Health, for instance. But even if you're not applying for this kind of U.S. federal funding, there are still several other legal, ethical, or contractual policies or institutions that may require you to manage your data in specific ways. And I've listed examples of these types of policies here. So we have uh, institutional review, review, yeah, review board policies. Um, we have laws such as HIPAA, FERPA, um, GDPR outside of the U.S. <clears throat> we have a variety of agreements. Uh, participant consent form agreements, for instance. We have um, data sharing agreements with places like school districts or departments of education. We have confidentiality agreements, um, as well as individual institutional data policies. All of these examples dictate various ways that we are required to manage data. But data management is also an ethical issue. So the data that we collect exists in the context of the world around us. And our data collection, management, ownership, and sharing practices must consider that context. So it's important that we take time to ask ourselves questions such as, who owns this data? Uh, how must we keep this data secure? How are we collecting and curating this data in a way that ensures equitable representation and confidentiality in our sample? How are we allowed to share this data? In addition to this, when we think about the burden that we put on communities when we collect that we collect data from and the funding that we are entrusted with to conduct our research, we can see that implementing poor data management that leads to irrelevant or unusable or compromised data is a huge disservice to research participants and erodes trust in the research process. Data management is also important because it allows our work to be reproducible. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the replication or reproducibility crisis. It's been talked about for quite a long time now. An example here is the 2016 Nature study that found that across 1,500 researchers surveyed, more than 70% had tried and failed to reproduce another researcher's study. So in, try in trying to combat this crisis, we should be managing our data in a way that allows our processes to be reproducible because reproducible data has a lot of benefits. It allows others to learn from our work and collaborate with us, which increases impact. Um, it also allows others to validate our results with which strengthens evidence. And poor data management can even prevent research researchers from implementing good open science practices. So in waves one and two of the open scholarship survey that was collected by the Center for Open Science, uh, the team found that of the education researchers surveyed, approximately almost 15% mentioned being nervous about mistakes as a reason for not sharing their data from their most recent work. <clears throat> and similar findings were found in other studies. So for instance, the 2018 study shown down here in the bottom right corner, uh, those authors surveyed 780 researchers in the field of psychology and found that 38% of respondents agreed that a fear of discovery of errors in the data posed a barrier to data sharing. And similar results were found in the Logan study as well. And last, but definitely not least, you might just be wondering, how does it affect me? Um, and the bottom line is that data management is worth it because it makes your life easier. So it might seem harder at first because it takes some time to impl implement, but the benefits are well worth it. So one, it facilitates the use of your data. So taking time to organize your files in a consistent way, for instance, means not having to waste time searching around for the most recent version of your data file. And taking time to consistently name and format your variables allows you to more easily integrate data across projects. Two, it improves continuity. So when staff turn over, you aren't having to start from scratch to train them because you have all of your processes well documented. Uh, three, it increases efficiency. So if you docu document and automate tasks by doing things like writing code for data cleaning, it reduces duplication of efforts for any repeating tasks, especially in those longitudinal studies. Uh, four, it upholds research integrity. So errors come in many forms from both humans and technology and implementing quality assurance and control procedures throughout a study reduces the chances of errors occurring and allows you to have more confidence in your data. And then last, it reduces this thing called data curation debt. So data curation debt is the time and money 
spent on fixing data that was created with poor data management practices. If you don't take time to think about data management early on in your project, I promise you when it comes time to analyze or share your data, it will be a huge feat to get that data into a usable format. So taking the time to implement quality data management throughout your entire study reduces that debt. So knowing how important data management is to a project, I wrote this book as a response to the, the lack of resources available for education researchers to learn these practices. So this book is a culmination of my experience as a data manager, as well as information gathered through discussions with other researchers and many, many hours spent reviewing existing data management resources to essentially develop a system for organizing a data management routine in a way that can be integrated into a researcher's project workflow. So that rather than researchers thinking of data management as one extra thing that they have to tack onto their already very busy schedule, they can see it as an integral part of their research study design. <clears throat> and in order to show how data management fits within the context of a research project lifecycle, I developed this figure. So this image shows both project management processes at the top and data management process processes at the bottom that happen throughout a project. So you can see here that data management is not a standalone process that happens off to the side or at the end of a project. It should be integrated into every phase of the project. This means every time you have a project task that in any way relates to data, data management should also be considered. And sometimes these two different paths are made up of different people, such as project managers and data managers. Other times, both paths consist of the same people. Maybe the project manager is man managing both administrative tasks and data management tasks. It applies either way. <clears throat> so let's uh, just walk through this diagram very quickly. So typically you start a project off by generating ideas, things you're interested in studying, and then the paths diverge while still happening simultaneously and collaboratively. So for example, if you're trying to fund your research study through a federal grant, you're typically writing up your proposal and your budget at the top while simultaneously writing up your required data management plan at the bottom. And then if your project is funded, you move on to the planning phase. So while you're planning things like recruitment and data collection activities at the top, you're also planning the specifics of how to actually implement your data management plan down at the bottom. And then you get into the cycle of data collection where you are actively collecting data. And in this cycle, data management is integrated into every step. And if you're collecting data longitudinally, every phase in this cycle should re be repeated each wave. So that means cleaning data each wave, updating documentation each wave, and so forth. And then once you've wrapped up all data collection activities and you're preparing for the end of your project, you're usually analyzing and writing up the results at the top, while also doing some sort of additional preparation for archiving your data at the bottom. And then hopefully you're able to publicly share your data for others to use for their own analyses or replications. And each chapter of this book walks through a phase of this research project lifecycle, helping you think through what data management practices you might consider implementing in that phase. And while I cannot summarize the entire book in this very brief talk, I want to share a few key takeaways that I think are important for all researchers to know about data management that will hopefully get you started on the right foot. So not too long ago, I was reading Aesop's fables to my son. And as some of you may know, these stories all culminate with lessons that the reader should take away from the story. And in the story of the crow in the picture, the lesson is, with a little planning, you can gain what at first seems impossible. And that same lesson is a huge part of what I try to convey in the book. Data management often seems overwhelming because we are winging it. But if we start making a plan early and get that plan written down, then at that point, we're simply just following a set of instructions. And doing this sort of planning removes any ambiguity in how data should be managed and ensures that our decisions are consistently implemented throughout a project. <clears throat> and by spending time planning, I mean going beyond writing the brief required data management plan. So data management sharing plans are great for high-level planning, but they don't necessarily prepare us for the complex day-to-day -day implement implementation of those plans in practice. So your data management plan might say, we are going to collect a teacher survey on classroom management practices using Qualtrics, and we're gonna download it as a CSV. 
we will remove all direct identifiers, check for errors, and save to a secure network drive. Great. That's awesome. That is an awesome high-level plan. But what I would want to know then is what items will be in the survey? How will they be formatted? How will those items be formatted? What is the exact process for creating, sending, tracking, downloading, cleaning that survey? When does each step happen along the way? How will data quality and security be ensured throughout each step? And who is responsible for each step of the process? These are the kinds of questions you will need to begin answering long before you ever collect data. <clears throat> and using tools such as checklists can help you think through all the various data management decisions that need to be made at each phase of a project. The book links to a set of example checklists to get you started, but of course, you can use whatever checklist works best for you or edit these checklists as needed. <clears throat> and as you work through your checklist, start to create workflows for every instrument you plan to collect. So a workflow for your teacher survey, a workflow for your um, student assessment data, a workflow for your district student records data. Plan the who, what, where, and when of each step of the data collection cycle. And as you're planning these workflows, build in steps for managing data quality and security throughout the process. <clears throat> so for instance, here's an example of a workflow for a student survey. This diagram in particular is designed using a swim lane format so that each person's tasks are shown in their particular lane, but you can use whatever format works for you. But notice that data management practices are interwoven throughout this workflow to help ensure that data quality and security are happening throughout all phases. <clears throat> Building these work kinds of types of workflows allow data management to be seamlessly integrated into your data collection process. Again, so that team members see data management as a natural part of the process, not an extra burden on their workload. And then finally, it's very helpful to go one step further and write down the specifics of each task of the workflow in a protocol or a standard operating procedure so that your team has a step-by-step -step reproducible plan for how data will be managed throughout data collection. All right, another takeaway is to get organized. When you think about a project, it's much easier to start off organized like the picture on the right than it is to take the mess on the left and try to organize and make sense of it after a project. And here, I'm specifically talking about making a plan for how you're going to organize and name files. As your project begins, you're going to have a lot of files that need to be stored. Many of these will be electronic, which you will hopefully store somewhere securely based on you know, your institution or IRB requirements, like somewhere like SharePoint or Box or an institutional network drive or something like that. And how you store and name these files will make a huge difference in how easy it is to work with your data. It's possible that you will have several people working on your team. And in order to get team members on the same page, it's important to set rules for how files should be organized before a project begins. So for instance, let's look at these two folder structures. The structure on the left was created with no guidelines about how information should be organized. And you can already tell that this structure is going to make it more difficult to find files. There's no real rhyme or reason to how folders were created. And it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to find a file that I need without spending several minutes clicking around looking for that file. And this kind of disorganization poses more problems than just making it difficult to find files. It also makes it more difficult to secure files because they may be spread across many different folders. So in this example, it looks like our data files might exist in at least four different locations, making it more difficult to limit access. And last, the inconsistent naming of folders will also make it less convenient to programmatically work with folders as needed. So machines have an easier time searching for information when files and folders are named using a specific set of rules. So on the other hand, you can tell that the folder structure on the right has been designed in a purposeful manner to make accessing, securing, and using files much easier. Similar story here, we have two different sets of file names. The set of file names on the left are very ambiguous and cause confusion about which file should be used, which in turn could lead to people using the wrong file. And again, the inconsistent file names are also going to make the files more programmatically difficult to work with. However, the set of file names on the right will be much easier to work with. We know exactly which is the most recent version of a file. And also the addition of the change log file at the bottom here ensures that we understand the differences between these three different versions. So in order to get organized early on, set up rules or guidelines for how project directories should be structured and how files should be named. 
So here are two examples of guidelines you could develop for both setting up a project folder structure and for how to name files. In the book, I call these style guides. Um, and setting up these kinds of standards early on in a project helps ensure that your files stay organized, making them easier to find and use. Another key takeaway is to document everything. So I am assuming every one of us on here has been on a team where we either are the documentation or we know someone who is the documentation. Um, but unfortunately that isn't sufficient. We can't rely on people to hold our project information in their brains. It needs to be written down. Why? One, it helps us standardize procedures, which in turn improves fidelity to practices. This also enables continuity when staff turnover, right? Two, it's important for strategic planning. Documentation helps us plan for how we will run every aspect of our project for the life cycle of a grant. Uh, three, having a documented plan for transferring, storing, and accessing data helps keep it secure and protects participant confidentiality. Four, it allows you to track data provenance or data lineage, meaning that you know what transformations have been done between the raw data and your final data set. Uh, five, documentation allows you to catch errors because you've documented what you expect to see in your data so you can identify when something doesn't look right. Think of a document like a, a data dictionary, for instance. Uh, six, it enables reproducibility. People can recreate your steps, especially in things like data wrangling. And then seven, and last but not least, documentation isn't just for you. It also enables others to use your data and use it correctly so that they aren't just guessing what a variable is or how it was collected. And documentation can be broken into four buckets. There's team level, project level, data level, and variable level. And these are just like they sound, documents that apply to the entire team across all projects, documents that apply to individual projects, documents that apply to particular data sets, and documents that apply to specific variables of a data set. And this book introduces you to all these different types of documentation so that you know that they exist and what their benefits are. Ultimately though, I encourage you to use the buffet approach. Uh, this is a term first coined by Christina Bergman. You can click on the link there to learn more. And the buffet approach just means that you don't have to do it all. You can decide to create just a few of these documents or you can create all of them. It's really up to you to choose which documents help improve your workflow and which ones are not necessary for your work. The key takeaways regarding documentation are the following. One, document your decisions, processes, and plans early on so that everyone gets on the same page. Two, Use your documentation as a guide. Refer to it often, especially when it comes to procedural documents, such as your data management plans, your protocols, your standard operating, operating procedures. It's really important to refer to your documentation often throughout your project so that you're implementing your processes consistently. So this improves the security, fidelity, and reproducibility of your data management practices. And then last, it's imperative that you keep your documentation up to date, because if you start a document, but you don't continue to update it with changes to the project or new decisions made throughout your project, then you no longer have an accurate record of what happened in your project. And if you're anything like me, if you wait until the end of your project to update your documentation, those decisions will be long gone. I have a hard time remembering what I did two weeks ago, let alone a few years ago. So anytime you do something such as make a change to a procedure or a change to a decision rule or add a new variable to an instrument, for instance, update that information in the relevant document and note when the change was made and why, so that you can track the history of how your project evolves. The next takeaway is to correct data at the source. So most people don't jump up and down at the chance to spend hours cleaning and organizing a data file. And if you are someone who would rather spend your time on analysis, not cleaning, then the number one way to reduce the amount of data cleaning that you need to do is to correct data at the source. This means plan the variables you want to collect, build your data collection entry tools in a way that follows your plan, test your data tools before collecting or entering data, check your data often during data collection entry. Doing this ensures that not only you have much less data cleaning to do in the end, but it also prevents you from potentially losing data or having to recollect bad data. So it's 100% worth the effort to spend time building in quality assurance and control procedures early on in your collection process. So let's walk through each of these steps real quick. So number one, plan the variables you want to collect. Think through every item that needs to be included in your instrument. Make sure you don't forget anything that might be necessary to have later on down the line, like a unique identifier, for instance. 
Then consider what are the allowable values for each item? What should the variable type be for each item? Character, date, numeric, and so forth. Tools such as data dictionaries, like the one you see here, are great documents to assist in this planning process. Then build your data collection and entry tools in a way that follows your plan. Uh, name your variables in your tool. So rather than using the, the tool default of Q1, Q2, Q3, instead, instead name your variables in your tool the way that you want them to be named. Second, also code any categorical variable values in your tool the way you want them to be coded. So for instance, if I want no to be coded as zero and yes to be coded as one, I do that in the tool. Uh, add data validation so that if you only want a numeric val values for a variable, you only allow numbers to be entered. Or if the range for a variable should only be one to five, restrict entries to just those ranges. And then last, use text boxes only when they're absolutely necessary to prevent having to clean data like we see over here to the right, where the word Philadelphia was entered 57 different ways. Sometimes you do really need a text box in order to be inclusive or because there is an infinite number of response options. But if you have something simple like, you know, 10 school names to choose from, use something like a drop down to prevent you from having to clean up a messy text variable. And just as an aside, for those of you who use a system like Qualtrics, here's just a brief look at the ways you can edit these backend features to fix data at the source. But most other data collection tools like RedCap, for instance, also have similar features. Next, you want to pilot test your tool, collect sample data, export it, and look at it. Does the data look as you expected it to? So if you expected your data to look like the data on the right, but your pilot data exports like the data on the left, now is the time to fix your tool. Doing this work now saves you tons of time and data cleaning in the future. And then last, you want to check your data often during data collection or entry. So for electronically collected data, periodically download it to make sure everything is still looking OK. And if it's not, depending on the error, it may still be possible to make corrections or to recollect bad data. For paper data, have a system for checking forms throughout data collection. If there are errors, like we see in the image here, the time to catch these errors is now, while you're still able to recollect bad data or missing information. As a, an aside, if you don't catch these types of errors until after data collection, this is when your planning and documentation kicks in. How did you decide to handle questions where someone circled an answer twice? Make sure that kind of decision is documented so that your team is dealing with these types of errors consistently. You can think of other situations where you need similar processes in place, right? So for instance, duplicate data. If someone completed a survey twice, what are the decision rules for which survey to keep? Those rules should be in your documentation so that you not only your team knows what your process is, but also future users know how you handled and processed your data. OK, next key takeaway, track incoming information. So as I mentioned earlier, if you are collecting data on a variety of participants using several different instruments over many different ways of data collection, it can be very overwhelming to keep track of all that information, especially if some of that information is being collected in the field. So in order to keep track of incoming information, I highly recommend keeping some sort of tracking database. <clears throat> so this database can be built in an actual database tool like RedCap or Microsoft Access, or it can be just kept in an Excel spreadsheet. I go through the pros and cons of different kinds of tools in the book. Ultimately, what matters most are these three things though. One, track often during data collection. A tracking database is not helpful to you if you wait to track forms until after data collection is complete. Instead, I recommend tracking daily during data collection so that you have an accurate record of what is happening and what data is left to be collected. Two, um, check data before tracking it. So this goes hand in hand with what we just talked about in the previous takeaway. Check your data before tracking it. Is the form actually complete or did someone actually skip some, accidentally skip some items? If it's not complete or it has errors, make note of that in your tracking sheet and send that form back out for correction. And then last, keep one single source of truth. Don't have four different people on your team keeping four different tracking spreadsheets. That's not helpful. Keep all information in one location that, so that you always know where to find the information you need and aren't having to rectify differences across spreadsheets. This database is an essential tool for both project management and data management. It allows you to keep track of and report on what's happening throughout a study 
And it also serves as a tool for verifying that you have complete data in your final data sets. Uh, the next takeaway is to assume some amount of error is inevitable. So even with the best data management plans in place, errors will still happen. All of our quality assurance and control practices hopefully reduce errors, but it's unlikely that they prevent all errors, especially in large scale projects with so much going on. So with that in mind, it's important that you always review your data sets for mistakes before finalizing them for use. Errors can happen in the data for many reasons, some of which come from mistakes during data collection and your capture process. Others come from the data cleaning process itself, coding errors, calculation errors, joining errors, um, but errors aren't going to be found if you don't actively look for them. Learn from the countless people who have found errors at the most inconvenient times, and instead try to catch as many errors as possible during your data cleaning process. So the book provides a checklist of steps to consider when cleaning a data set for the purposes of data sharing. And throughout that cleaning process, a series of checks should be implemented. So you want to check your data before cleaning so you know exactly what you're working with and what needs to be corrected. You want to check your data during data cleaning, meaning um, check each transformation that you do, check both before and after to make sure the transformation worked as expected and that you didn't somehow accidentally introduce new errors into your data during your cleaning process. And then do one final data check um, at the end of cleaning to make sure your data looks as you intended it to. And in the book, I call this data validation. And during data validation, you want to use a data quality checklist to do your final review. Um, using a checklist like the one provided in the book helps you implement a more systematic process and ensures you don't forget to check certain things. And the last key takeaway for today is this idea that slow science pays off in the long run. Everything I've talked about up until this point takes time. Planning, documenting, tracking, validating data, all takes time. But this kind of planful, ongoing data management pays off in the end. When you think about having all the benefits we talked about earlier on in this presentation, data that can be reproduced, data that you can trust, data that is secure, files that are easy to find, access, use, and understand, all those things happen from doing things right in the first place not waiting to fix whatever happened at the end of the project. And on top of the benefits we've already discussed, a common concern about the increasing data sharing requirements from funders is the burden it puts on teams for, to prepare data for sharing. But if you've managed your data throughout a project, so you've kept up with documentation, you've kept up with data cleaning, data val validation, and so forth, then you've greatly reduced any burden that comes from data sharing at the end of a project. It's also important to remember that data management does get easier the more you do it. Once you have standards and templates and protocols in place, those documents and processes can be reused, easing burdens in future projects as well. And last, it's also important to acknowledge that I mentioned a lot of practices throughout this book, and not every practice will make sense for your team or your project. And even if all of them do make sense, it's unlikely that your team has the bandwidth to do it all. So instead, start, start by implementing good enough practices. As I mentioned earlier, you don't have to create all the documentation. You also don't have to implement the most ideal folder structure or use the most sophisticated data cleaning methods. You simply need to use methods that are good enough to reach your goals. The idea of this book is to find the practices that work for you and your team and implement them consistently in order to achieve the quality outcomes you desire. And then over time, you can improve your data management practices as needed. Ultimately, I think we should all strive for in our data management practices is eloquently summed up in this quote from uh, Rex Sanders. And they say, if the data you need still exists, if you found the data you need, if you understand the data you found, if you trust the data you understand, if you can use the data you trust, someone did a good job of data management. And that is the book in a nutshell. <laughs> so I've linked to um, the open access book here, as well as my personal website, where I have additional data management resources for anyone who is interested. But I am here to answer questions now. All right. Thanks, Crystal. This is great. Um, we do have some questions that have definitely uh, come in. And so I'm wondering if you can go back 
a couple of slides to your lovely chart that a lot of folks have said uh, is is very nice. Uh, that that one, the yeah, yeah. It's gonna go back to person. One second. <laughs> oh, I did. Oh, I did pass it. Sorry, I'm going too fast. Uh, where'd you go? This one. Yes. So. Um, <laughs> The first question is just a clarification question on um, does version mean version control in that? And can you yeah. speak a little bit to version control? That's a great question. So, I, I mean, I do go into the specifics of what I mean by version in the book. But yes, um, I I don't talk about tools like GitHub or Git in the book. I talk more about manually versioning, versioning things because in education research, we, we typically aren't pushing you know, confidential data to to places like GitHub. But I talk about um, manually versioning file names and things like that by adding either a date or a version number and then keeping a change log of the differences between those files. So that's what I mean by versioning is kind of if you if you finalize a data set and then six months later you catch an error in that data and you and you want to update it, um, versioning that file. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, another question is um, so this person is interested in the steps of data management that are, are newer to them. So track, capture, uh, I think store, um, and also versioning. Um, and can you can you elaborate a little bit more on these steps? Um, in this person's experience, after completing collection through the instrument, they lock the data, mean, meaning that no edits can be made anymore. And then they use a copy from it to do cleaning and preparation. So they're wondering if that's a good um, practice to have generally, or if there's um, another another way of, of making that yeah, work. Yeah, I think that sounds very similar to what I talk about in the book. Um, yeah, I, I typically say, you know, you download a, a raw file from the tool and then and then from there you make a copy or, you know, you edit it in a, in a um, syntax file so you're not directly editing the raw file and clean it up and have a saved final version of your data set at the end. Um, and the tracking, I think, is, is new for some people um, because I think this is something that is more specific to uh, tracking human subject participant data. It's more like if somebody's out in the field and they're bringing these paper files, it's it's helpful to have a place where you're kind of checking a box that like that file came in, it's complete, we're good to go. Um, for, again, for both project management and data management purposes. Gotcha. Um, um, someone is wondering if you could, um, if, or based on your research and experience over the last 10 years, um, what aspects of data management um, are most daunting for the education researchers that you've worked with? Um, I, shoot. <laughs> I think it depends um, on where they at, where they're at as far as like how well they're building that kind of data validation in their tools and things like that. I think that the data cleaning part can be extremely daunting for people if they didn't um, build in a lot of that quality assurance and control early on, because you can get data that's just so messy that it takes such a large amount of time to clean up and so much um, decision making. So typically in data cleaning, it's, it shouldn't have a lot of decision making because you're just maybe doing some recoding or some renaming and it's not really like that um, heavily involved in um, the team having to make decisions around it. But if you have really messy data where people are entering in text values and what should have been a numeric value, it's a lot of these, you have to kind of go through one by one and decide how to how to deal with that. So I would say data cleaning ends up being the most daunting if you don't build in a lot of those good practices early on. Awesome. Um, uh, more questions are coming in. Um, one person would like to know when, if you're thinking about um, if you're wanting to hire um, on your project team, um, somebody that can handle all of this uh, project management and data management, um, what would you say are some of the more important characteristics uh, in a candidate? So would it be specialized knowledge about the education sector, about specific kinds of education data, or would it be more overall time that they've been spending working on research tasks? Like what would you prioritize? Yeah. Um, I. I don't think it requires uh, super specialized knowledge. I do think it, some content knowledge is helpful um, to be able to make decisions about education data um, in particular can be really helpful. So just like a basic understanding of what kind of variables you get in an education data set is very helpful. Um, and then I think it's mainly um, more about organization. You know, somebody who's really detail oriented, 
um, who can keep them keep everything organized and who can take the time to thoroughly look through a data set because you need someone who is okay with that. Most people hate that job. <laughs> so, but when you find somebody who enjoys that, like that's, that's your golden ticket right there because it takes, you really need somebody who enjoys that and wants to take the time to go through the nitty gritty of a data set um, and make sure that it's thorough and accurate and things like that. All right. Um, <clears throat> could you talk a little bit about what typically goes into a data dictionary? Yeah, so a data dictionary um, is a kind of rectangular formatted, typically spreadsheet. Um, and, and what you would put into a data dictionary uh, is all of your variables that you plan for a particular data set. So typically what I do is make one data dictionary per instrument. So if I have like a teacher survey, I'll have a data dictionary for a teacher survey. And I would put every variable in that uh, data dictionary that I plan to collect as well as any data variables that I plan to add in after collection. So if I'm going to merge in something afterwards, like a treatment variable, I'll put that in there. Or if I'm going to calculate a sum score for the final data set, I'll put that in there as well. So it, it's a planning document for what's going to go into the instrument, as well as a planning document for what I'm going to create during the cleaning process. Um, and so for every variable, I plan the, the details of that variable. So what the name is going to be of that variable, what the um, label is for that variable or what the question is for that variable, what type that variable is going to be, what the allowable values of that variable are, whether that's categorical or numeric, or maybe it's um, a date format. Um, and then sometimes I'll put in some extra information that I would wanna know in the future, like who's getting this variable? You know, Is it only a subset of my sample and things like that. Um, so you can make it as detailed or as, you know, as simple as you want, but I think those four or five things that I first mentioned are like a necessary part of a data dictionary. And then in my experience, data dictionaries have usually been in like a, a table format, like a, an Excel sheet or something like yeah, that. Exactly. Is that the same in your experience? It is, it is. And, and I know that people make these in different ways. I just find that the easiest to kind of manipulate and kind of organize as needed. Cause I also use, there's so many ways to use a data dictionary. I also use it to actually import it into, I use R for data cleaning. So I actually import it into R and I can actually manipulate it and use it in my cleaning process. So there's a lot of benefits to using that kind of spreadsheet format. All right. Uh, somebody is also asking if you could talk a little bit to the concept of the buffet approach again. Yeah, I, so the person who originally wrote about that was talking about open science practices in general. And I just thought that was such a cool way to think about it. There, we're, we're constantly bombarded with things that we should be doing, right? You need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. <laughs> and, and it gets to the point where it's debilitating because people are like, I, there's so much I should be doing. I don't even know where to begin. I'm just not going to do anything. And so I think the buffet approach is a way to think about like, what can I start with now that won't be so scary? <laughs> so, you know, and, and when I talk about the buffet approach for documentation, like, like I said, I mentioned probably like, 30 different documents in the book. And that's not to scare people away. It's just to say, here's your options, pick out what makes sense for you and and, and just go from there. Um, and so it's just a way of, of not overwhelming people with so much information. Awesome. Um, we have a couple of questions that are um, uh, talking a bit about, you know, merging different um different data sets and such. So um, as an example, someone mentioned an example where um, data might be shared across various functional teams, um, but there's no universal data dictionary available due to, you know, legacy issues. Um, and someone else mentioned, um, you know, in talking about and combining data from various sources and, sim and, and systems, and that can be complex sometimes. Um, have you um, dealt with that at all? And, and what are some strategies that you might use for, for at least getting started and how to organize and get all your head wrapped around all of that? Yeah, so that's a lot. <laughs> it all, a lot of that's like, it depends. Um, so two things that stood out to me are, what if you have data coming in from just different sources? How do you end up combining that? Um, and a lot of that speaks to the whole quality assurance, quality control piece. And so when you build collection tools from different sources, make sure that you're building it in a way that you will eventually be able to bring data together so that you have your linking IDs, you know, and there for sure, and that variables that need to be matched together are going to be able to match together. 
And the same thing even goes for external data sources. So maybe you're getting something from um, a school district or a state department of education. Uh, if you're able to work with those external um, people, you know, you can potentially help um, organize those data sets before they come to you. Say, I would really love if it had X, Y, Z in it, and I would really love it to be formatted this way. And so trying to do that front end work so that putting these data sets together eventually is, is less of a headache. Um, and then as far as like storing and putting things together, I mean, what I talk about in the book is, is that you'll eventually just download a series of raw data sets and they will all be dropped into a single storage place. And that um, those can be shared individually if you want, or you can pre-merge them together for people before sharing. And I think that's a, just a personal choice um, as far as how you want to do that. All right. Um, one person said they appreciated the response that you shared about versioning and the reasons uh, for typically not using Git and GitHub in education research. Um, this person wanted to know if you had any resources on your website or elsewhere that discuss, you know, these kinds of considerations around GitHub or around um, other versioning platforms in, in the education research context. I don't actually think I really talk about that. in the. I mean, I think I pretty much maybe have a line or two about why we don't use GitHub, but I don't, I haven't talked about it publicly on any other um, posts or anything. I just say it out loud. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm always open because I, you know, obviously I have not met every researcher in the world. So I would also be interested if people are using GitHub and how they're using that with confidential data, you know, by not pushing the data, but maybe they push their code. Um, I'm always just very curious to see what other people's, um, you know, processes are. Okay. Um, another question that came in um, involves how these processes uh, apply to working with metadata. Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to dive a ton into metadata in the book until I get to data sharing. And, and at that point, I talk about metadata in the context of um, metadata in a repository. And I keep it very simple because to, to be truthful, I think people might sometimes get overwhelmed by the term metadata. I get overwhelmed by the term metadata sometimes because I'm like, well, what does it mean by metadata? Um, and so I tried to simplify it as much as possible to say metadata is not some scary thing that you have to like wrangle some crazy machine readable file and it's going to be really intimidating. For the most part, when you deposit data into a repository, it's going to be a form. They're going to say, please enter some information for these six different um, variables about your data or your project, and then you hit submit, and then that's it. And so I try to make the, the discussion around metadata to be less scary and just to say, just prepare for it. Maybe go ahead and look up a repository you're going to share at and see what they ask for and what's needed and start preparing for that. But other than that, all the documentation you collect throughout your project is going to inform your metadata at the end. So it's not necessarily... Um, a heavy lift at the end to add metadata to your to your repository. I don't even know if I answered the question. I've already forgotten what the question was. Yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> I think that makes sense. That yeah, you want to plan for it, right? But you don't have to make it into a whole yeah um, huge ordeal. You can um, use uh, different different tools for yes, for yes. creating metadata and for organizing it. You don't have to be uh, uh, a guru at like XML and, and yeah, super tech savvy to do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Someone had a question on what your thoughts are uh, on the use of Google Forms to collect information. I, I am open to any tools people want to use. What I tell people to do is to make sure that your institution approves it. And I don't know, you know, Google Forms might be approved, but I would check with both your institutional review board, so your IRB, if you need to work with them, and also just your IT or your InfoSec people. They have huge opinions about what tools they want you to use for security and confidentiality. So I think I would just always defer to a person's institution about what tools to use. Um, I have preferences for things like, you know, does it have, does it allow you to do data validation, things like that. And I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head what Google Forms allows you to do because I can't remember. But as long as it has the ability to do some of the things that I talked about, so building in that back end data validation and renaming variables, how you want to name them, those kind of things are important to look for. But other than that, I would definitely talk with your institution. And similarly, in terms of thinking about active data, uh, research data management, if there are platforms or tools that you, um, you like to use for that. 
Um, yeah. For, so I, again, I, I don't, I don't like to be like, this is my go-to tool. Cause I really think that there's no, there's no perfect tool and there's no really bad tool. So I think they're all fine. Um, however you want to, whichever one you want to use. Um, I've used Qualtrics. I've used, you know, RedCap for survey data collection. They're, they're both fine. They both meet the needs of what I've needed to do. Um, and then for as far as tracking databases, I've used FileMaker, I've used RedCap, I've used Microsoft Access. Any of them are fine, honestly. Um, wonderful. Um, somebody asked if you had recommendations for data management in qualitative research, um, for instance, interview transcripts, coding, and thematic analyses. Someone did respond with the qualitative data repository, which um, where I'm uh, personally a big fan of, but they have a lot of resources uh, there. But I don't know if you want to speak to, I know you have some commentary in there about qualitative, and you and I have talked about it since yeah. we talked qualitative <laughs> together. But um. Yeah, not, I mean, I don't have anything additional to say about it. You know, I, I make it pretty clear in the book that my, my experience is almost exclusively around quantitative data, but that doesn't mean that a lot of these practices can't be applied to qualitative data. Um, and so I do mention the qualitative data repository um, as a place to share that data um, at the end. But I think a lot of these practices are going to be pretty similar um, you know, you're you're going to want to use some of the same data cleaning practices to, to de-identify data. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when you have transcripts and things like that, you're still coding it into something that ends up being somewhat quantitative in the end. And so a lot of these practices, I think, are um, can be applied to either type of data. But honestly, Crystal, if you have anything else to add, because you're the expert in the qualitative data. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say like a lot of the stuff that you mentioned around, you know, making sure that you have a file structure that makes sense that you can find stuff at, that it's centralized, that it's named appropriately, and that people know what they're looking at when they're looking at it, having good file names, all of those are important for managing qualitative data just as quantitative data. Um, there are potentially some additional questions that you might want to talk about within your lab about what constitutes data because there may be things about field notes and lab meeting memos and and reflexive journals and stuff like that and does that count as data and if so how do you share that and that may be some additional conversations within your lab but i don't think that there's a set standard um for those i think that's still active conversation within the qualitative open science community so um so yeah, so I'd say like a lot of what you have in your book is actually um, is actually I think also applies to qualitative, but there may be some tweaking that that individual labs may have to do, which is also true for folks working with quantitative data. Um, so yeah, um, uh, we have a, a time for maybe one or two more questions, and there are two questions still in the queue. Um, one is that um, they just they noticed the title of the book. Um, and so they're curious about what defines large scale and how does that differentiate between small scale education uh, research? Yeah, again, it's kind of like the qualitative quantitative discussion. I think all of this still applies to large scale. I think this came up, the book came up because of, I worked on a lot of these um, longitudinal, multi-cohort, um, large sample size studies that, like I said, become extra overwhelming to deal with. Um, and so it's more just like, it's it's just harder to manage data um, the, the, the larger the project gets. So again, based on time, based on how many forms you're collecting and, and those kinds of things and, and the different types of participants you're collecting from. And so um, I think that large scale is where this kind of whole idea came from because it was like, how do you manage all these things coming in? But it, the smaller, it, it actually just hopefully gets a little easier, but you can still apply the practices. Yeah, and I think that also applies for some of the folks that are in uh, that are in the webinar may also be outside of education research. I think I think a lot of these practices um, are also really important, regardless of whether you're working in education or in a similar field. Right. Um, and then the last question um, is, is a little bit more of a personal one, I think. Um, the, well, it's a two-parter. Um, the first is, like, are there other research fields that are more advanced in education um, regarding these practices? And the second is, like, uh, where did you draw your management inspiration from? And those might, those might be related. Um. Uh, yeah. So I think all the things I talked about earlier, as far as, like, where are people learning data management, that's where I learned it, right? So <laughs> experience mentors, colleagues, um, and then a lot of uh, 
external resources. Um, so reading other people's books, reading people's blogs, things like that. So that's, that's essentially where I learned it. Um, a lot of trial and error, which is not the best way to learn, but again, we're trying to change that. Um, and then, sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> Crystal, I've already um, if there are other fields that you think oh. have, maybe have a, a good data management practices that we can learn from in education. Yeah, I think psychology, honestly, Crystal, you could probably talk about SIPs. I think psychology has been working very hard about um, developing standards that can be applied across the field. And so um, standards is a, is a huge thing that would be very helpful for the field of education research as well, so that we aren't kind of all doing their, our own separate things um, and we can kind of um, more easily uh, plan and integrate data sets as needed and things like that. Um, so I don't, Crystal, you want to mention SIPs real quick? <laughs> sure, yeah. So for folks that are interested, if you're in a social science field, there's also the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, which is SIPs for short. Um, and that uh, that has, um, they are a group of folks that are working together to develop a lot of these guidelines as they are needed and to develop resources to teach other people how to implement not just data management, but also um, working towards reproducibility and replicability and, and all of that. Um, so, um, so, th and so thank you um, so much, Crystal. This has been fantastic. Um, there are a lot of really good resources that are in this book. I hope that folks have a chance to to check it out. Um, it is online, available, open access. Anybody can can access it. There is now also a print version of it that people can order. Um, I believe there's a link uh, to the ability to order it on on the website for if if you prefer a paper copy. Um, for those who are interested, who might want to come back to this recording later, um, the Center for Open Science will be uploading this webinar to its YouTube channel, um, and we'll also send that link out, as well as some of the other links that were posted in the chat um, to Crystal's book, to her website, um, to the slides, all of that. We'll send that out in an email to anybody that has registered for uh, for this webinar. So thank you again. Please feel free to share the recording with others. Um, we made this freely available because we want folks to have access to this. Um, and if you have questions for us, you can always email us at COS or you can also email Crystal. Her information is on uh, her website. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you, everyone.